You wouldn't call Maidstone a beautiful town. It used to be a town where local farmers brought their livestock and food to sell. Little remains of the old city. Markets have long been replaced by shopping centers and office buildings. The river, which is its most scenic feature, runs through the town center, but in general people travel to Maidstone for work or shopping. None of this bothered Maria as she headed from the train station to the hotel. She was there for one purpose only, and the sooner this was over, the sooner she could return to her children. Men's heads turned as she walked down the street, dragging a suitcase behind her. They say that for men, there are two types of women. The ones you want to get into bed and the ones you want to bring home to meet your mother. Maria managed to gain a foothold in both camps. It had almost six feet growth. She stood taller in heels, with a toned figure that belied the fact that she had given birth to two children. Her long, dark hair flowed over her shoulders, framing her oval face with piercing blue eyes. She had the elegant gait of a woman accustomed to high heels, and her hips swayed as she walked. Today she was wearing a black skirt suit. The tailored jacket accentuated her small waist, and the hem of the skirt fell just above her knees. She first saw him when she approached the hotel. He was tall and broad-shouldered, with a confident gait. A little over forty, she thought, looking at him. His hair was short and dark, but was beginning to turn gray. He was wearing a dark linen suit. Brown loafers on his feet completed the image of a man dressed elegantly and confident. She tried to imagine her husband William wearing such clothes. She thought it would suit him. William, sometimes Will, but never Bill, was the same. The thought of her husband brought tears to her eyes. This will end soon, she told herself, knowing deep down that it would never end. She reached the hotel entrance and pushed the door open with her left hand. The door didn't budge. She switched hands so that her suitcase was now in her left hand and pushed hard with her right. The door still didn't move. Let me, said a voice from behind her. A linen-clad hand reached past her and opened the door. She was overcome with embarrassment. You must think I'm such a fool, she said as he held the door for her. Not at all. Your thoughts were obviously busy with other things. I'm glad to be of service. And now, after you please. Her face was still flushed when she walked up to the front desk to check in. She noticed the man kept his distance while she checked in and received her key. She looked back at him as she picked up her key. Thank you for your help with the door. Will you be staying here for a long time? What was she doing asking a strange man how long he would stay here? She meant it as polite conversation, but it could have been taken as a sign of interest. Just for one night. I don't expect to be here much time after tomorrow. Just one night, he said, which eased her embarrassment. She wouldn't like him hanging around all week imagining that she was interested in him. Maria entered the elevator and turned around to see him looking at her. She smiled and waved at him as the doors closed. When the elevator started moving, she again cursed herself for this wave of interest. The hotel had only three stars. She had chosen it because of its location, so she was relieved to find a rather nice, clean room. She lay down on the bed and found it quite comfortable. In the blink of an eye, she unpacked her things and took a shower. She sat on the bed and called her mother, who was looking after her children. Tears welled up in her eyes as she talked to her children. She missed them so much. She watched the news on TV and wished she had brought a book with her. Making a mental note to buy one the next day, she went downstairs for dinner. At the hotel restaurant, she was shown to her table. She did not see him enter, but, raising her glass of wine, she felt someone's gaze on her. She turned, and when she caught his eye, he smiled at her and raised his glass. Throughout dinner, she looked around and found him watching her. She found herself in a difficult position. On the one hand, she didn't want to encourage him. On the other hand, she desperately wanted someone to talk to, and he seemed like a nice person. She felt slightly disappointed when he stood up and did not come over, but left the restaurant and left the hotel. Having finished her meal and drained her glass of wine, Maria left the restaurant. She noticed a bar at the other end of the lobby. Maybe there would be someone there she could talk to to take her mind off the tasks of the day ahead. 
She was drinking her second vodka tonic when he came in and sat down on the stool next to her. The bartender came over and the man ordered a beer. Can I buy the girl a drink? Maria hesitated. It's just a drink, he said. I need company and you seem to be lonely. By the way, my name is Paul. She smiled at him. Nice to meet you, Paul. I'm Maria. I'll have a vodka tonic if possible. Paul took his glass and ordered another for Maria. The bartender returned and Paul took both drinks. He nodded towards the empty table. Maybe we can take this somewhere a little more private? Fine. They walked to the table and sat down. I thought you went out for the night, she said. No, I just went for a walk down the river. I probably won't be able to do that anytime soon, so I thought I'd make the most of a lovely evening. I didn't even know there was a river walk in this town, but that can't be what brought you to Maidstone. No, I'm here for what can be called a final interview. If everything goes as I expect, I'll be gone for a few years. Hmm, sounds intriguing. Where are you going to go? I do not know exactly. I think it hasn't been decided yet. Oh, coming from you, it sounds so mysterious. You're not going to be someone like James Bond, are you? No, nothing like that. Although I will work for Her Majesty. What about you? What brings a beautiful married lady to the Maidstone Hotel to talk to a strange man? Maria took a sip of her drink and rubbed her rings. Actually, I'm a widow, and I don't think you really want to know about me. Oh, but I want to. Besides, you look like you need someone to talk to. I'll get you another drink, and you can decide if you want to talk to me. Paul stood up and returned with another beer and a vodka tonic. As he set her glass down, Maria touched his hand, running her fingers over his ring finger. Where there used to be a ring, there is depression. Is it for me, or is it the reason for the sadness in your eyes? This is not the story you want to hear, but I want to. I'm a good listener, and you need to tell me. Come on, you tell me your story, and I'll tell you mine. Paul noticed that she was starting to get a little drunk. She fumbled her words and stumbled when forming sentences. Okay, I'll tell you, but then it's your turn. Okay, first you, then me. Maria took a sip of beer from Paul's glass. There is no alcohol in this beer. You had to be drunk to keep me company. I need a clear head in the morning. I can't go to an interview with a hangover. Now that you've exposed me, do you still want to hear my story? Maria nodded. Fine. I used to work at a university. I enjoyed conducting research and teaching students. The problem was the lousy salary. I never made enough money for Josie. Josie is my wife. She always needed more. With the arrival of two children, Alex, now seven, and Kate, now five, money became even tighter. Josie started working extra hours in the evenings, and at my university I pushed for more pay. The point is that universities have set pay scales, and you cannot progress without publishing your work. I needed to post more, but I didn't have time. I couldn't work on publications during the day without neglecting my regular work. I would have done it in the evening, but I was looking after the kids while Josie was at work. Even when we both worked, it was still never enough. When Josie's brother told me that he makes a lot more money as a truck driver, I started thinking about it. The problem was that Josie was thinking about it too. To her, the increased income meant more than the fact that I loved my job. Long story short, she used the kids as emotional blackmail to get me to quit my job and rent a big truck. Her brother gave me all the contacts, and soon I was delivering goods all over the country. Josie quit overtime and we were fine for a while. Then I found out that while I was away, she found herself a boyfriend. Oh, Paul, this is terrible. How do you know? Her boyfriend told me. He sent me a multimedia message. Photos and videos of her cheating on me with him. The thing is, he used her phone to send it. I expected to receive a loving message from my wife but I received a malicious message from her lover and all these photos and videos. She tried to tell me that it was just one time and that he sent the message because she told him they would never do it again. So you didn't believe her? You should have seen the look in her eyes in those photographs. 
She hasn't looked at me like that in years. I couldn't look at her again without seeing those images. Divorce was the only option. Once Josie realized I was serious about the divorce, she became terrible. She told me he wasn't the first and wouldn't be the last. It was my fault that I didn't make enough money for her to stay home. After the divorce, I should have had access to my children, but I haven't seen them in five months. Either they are unwell or they have a special day off. Then they go on vacation during my time and things like that. Maria stood up, walked over to Paul, kissed him on the cheek and pressed him to her chest. How could she do this to you? No wonder you want to run away. What about her lover? What happened to him? She began to wobble in her high heels, and Paul felt the need to help her back into place. Once she sat back down, he continued. Well, of course he was married, but there is no point in pursuing him. He died in a traffic accident about three weeks after he sent me this message. Does his wife know? No, I do not think so. I don't see any point in adding to her suffering. The poor woman lost her husband. What good would it do for her if she found out that he really was a worthless piece of shit? Well, if I had my way, I think I would want her to know. This will help her move on. Now she looks at him as a kind of saint, and for her, no man will ever compare to him. If she finds out he's a bastard, it'll be easier for her to find someone else. You have to tell her, Paul. You have to. At first she will hate you for it, but later she will be glad that you did it. Promise me, promise me that you will tell her. Paul shook his head. Maria stamped her foot and spoke sharply. Promise me, or I won't tell you anything about myself. Fine. Okay. I promise. Maria took another sip of her drink. So now you want to know why I'm here. I'm here to face the man who killed my husband, my William. Someone killed him? Oh my God, this is terrible. How did this happen? Well, they call it an accident, but he killed him just as surely as if he had pointed a gun at him. He may not have wanted it, but he did nothing to avoid it. Maria, you speak in riddles. How did he kill William? He crushed it. Poor Will was sitting in his car on the side of the road, and this man crashed into him with a 40-ton truck. It flew off the road onto the side of the road and crushed his car like a matchbox. He didn't stand a chance. Tears flowed down Maria's cheeks. Her anger caused a rush of adrenaline, and her speech became less slurred. She dabbed her cheeks with a napkin. Paul waited for her to calm down. But it was an accident, right? I mean, he didn't hit him on purpose, did he? Maria began to sob. Paul put his arm around her and held her close. The sob stopped and she continued. He was texting, Paul. Witnesses saw this. He kept his phone on the steering wheel and sent a message. That's why he lost control of his truck. He was speeding 60 miles an hour down Detling Hill, texting. My beloved husband had to die so he could send the message. Paul held her head to his chest as she cried. The bartender started to approach, but Paul raised his hand to indicate that everything was fine. Maria hugged him with one arm and pressed her face tightly against him. Slowly, she pulled herself together and pushed away from him. Sorry, Paul. I think I can handle this. She took another sip of her drink. Sorry. I need to go to the ladies' room. Paul watched her stagger towards the toilet. When she returned, her face looked better, but he noticed that she was still drunk. She caught the bartender's attention and ordered another drink. She asked Paul if he would like the same drink, but he shook his head. She returned to her seat and asked, What else do you want to hear? Well, you could tell me about William. What kind of person was he? Maria's face brightened, and the sparkle returned to her eyes. Do you want me to describe him? He's tall, dark, and handsome. That's just the beginning. He had magnificent eyes. I could get lost in those eyes. When I was with him, I felt like the most important woman in the world. I saw other women look at me, wondering what I had done to deserve such a man. Even the girls at work, they all wanted to dance with him at Christmas parties. As he walked away from them, I saw the envy in their eyes as they looked at me. So he was good looking, but that's not all, is it? No, that's not true, and that's not at all what he was. He was the best husband and father I could ever ask for. If he wasn't traveling, he attended all the children's school events. 
We didn't need anything, and he was the kindest, most loving person. I used to see other people struggling to save their marriages, and I felt so successful. It sounds like he was like a real angel. No wonder you miss him so much. Maria smiled at him. Oh, no. Will was not an angel. He was quite ruthless at work. He was willing to do anything to make a sale. Then, of course, there was rugby. Don't tell me he was a bad loser. While always said that there are no good losers, only losers. To make matters worse, he was a terrible winner. Will never understood the meaning of the word magnanimous in victory. When his team won, he was ruthless towards his opponents. So there was another side to him. Oh, yes, but he never bought any of this into the house. This murderer deprived me of an exemplary husband. Talking about her husband definitely brought the color back to Maria's face. Well, what could this driver say in his defense? Nothing, and this makes it even more painful. He didn't even say he regretted doing it. Ah, well, he wouldn't be allowed to do that. His insurance company would have a fit. From a legal point of view, an apology is like an admission of guilt. He will need insurance to continue working. You mean he could still be driving? I didn't think about that. Well, he might have a family. He still has to put food on the table. Oh, yes, I suppose so. I imagined him lonely, but you're right. He probably does have a family. In fact, it only makes things worse. If he has a family, he should be more responsible. The bartender brought her a drink. This should be the last. The bar is closing now, he said. He returned to the bar and began to lower the shutters. So how are you going to confront him? She took a long sip from her glass. That's why I chose this hotel. It is conveniently located near the courthouse. He is expected to appear in court tomorrow. I'm going to be there. He'll have to look me in the eyes and understand what he's done. Understand? And what do you want to happen? I hope they lock it up and throw away the key, but that's unlikely to happen. He may even get away with it. The police never found the SMS on the phone, so they don't have good evidence. What will you do if he leaves the courtroom with a sentence without going to prison? I don't know. I didn't think that far ahead. She drained her glass and stood up. As soon as she stood up, she fell back into the chair. Oops, looks like I drank more than I thought. I haven't had a drink in so long. Paul stood up and took her hands. Let me help you, he said, lifting her from her seat. She stood up. Paul stood next to her and put his arm around her waist. She hugged him with one arm. Now, my knight in shining armor, would you like to show me to my room? This is number 211. Do you think you can find it? I'm sure I can handle it, he said, leading her to the elevator. When the doors closed, she turned to him. You know, Paul, I really don't want to be alone tonight. Do you think you could... The elevator began to move. Oh, Maria, I don't think that's a good idea. You drank too much. In the morning, you will hate yourself and me. I won't do this, and you'll leave in the morning. We will never have to see each other again. They exited the elevator and walked down the corridor. Maria held on to Paul as tightly as she could. Just because I won't be here doesn't mean you won't hate me or yourself. They reached her door, and Maria turned to Paul. It's okay, Paul. I understand. Why would a man like you be interested in an old widow like me? This is not true, Maria. If things had been different, the wild horses would not have kept me out of this room. She turned away, found her key, and opened the door. She reached out and took Paul's hand. Please, Paul, I don't think I can stand being alone tonight. Don't make me beg. Paul reluctantly followed her into the room. Maria took off her shoes and then walked over to the minibar. Don't you think you've had enough? Asked Paul. Maria turned around with two bottles of water in her hand. What do you prefer? With gas or without gas? Paul smiled and chose without gas. She brought him water, and when he took the bottle, she tilted his head and kissed him. He felt his resolve slipping away. Despite what his head said, he knew that he needed her as much as she needed him. You know, you look a lot like him. On whom? You are very similar to William, my husband, in some ways. Paul took off his jacket and hung it over the back of his chair. Maria looked at him. He was maybe a little more muscular. 
he trained a lot. And then, of course, there was rugby. Maria, are you sure you want to do this? She came over, sat on his lap, and began stroking his cheek. Will you stop worrying about me? I need to be with someone tonight, and from what you're saying, you may not have a chance to be with a woman for some time. Why don't we help each other? She kissed him, and this time Paul was very responsive. When they broke the kiss, Maria stood up, unfeasoned the waistband of her skirt, then let it fall to the floor. When she fell, the most beautiful, slender legs he had seen in a long time were revealed. She was wearing stockings and a girdle, which always turned Paul on. He watched her until the skirt was followed by a blouse, revealing a delicate lace bra that supported a pair of magnificent breasts. Maria was still unsteady on her feet as she stood in front of him, legs apart. She looked down at the bulge in his pants. I see you like something about this old widow. There's nothing old about you, and yes, I find everything about you attractive. If things had been different, you would have fought me off with a stick. Maria took his hands and lifted him to his feet. She kissed him. No more protests. I really need to be loved tonight. You seem like a good person. You're divorced. I'm a widow. So we're not hurting anyone. Just give me this night. I promise that in the morning I will still respect you. Maria woke up at 8 a.m. after the best night's sleep she could remember. What a dream she had. Her will came back to her. They made love. And it was wonderful. Her head was throbbing. Slowly, it all came back to her as she found her purse and took out a couple of paracetamol tablets. She headed to the bathroom. She remembered Paul. Oh, my God, she said to herself. I rushed at him. After washing and dressing, she decided to find Paul before he left and apologize for her behavior. On the way to the restaurant for breakfast, she asked the receptionist for his room number. Sorry, Mrs. Lancaster, the attendant told her. Mr. Robertson checked out about ten minutes ago. I think he was on his way to the post office, so you might catch him there if you hurry. Maria cursed to herself. No, it wasn't anything important, thank you. She had breakfast and headed to the courthouses. Upon arrival, she was greeted by a bailiff who told her name and directed her to the prosecutor in the case. He told her that there was no real need for her presence. Sorry, Mrs. Lancaster, but you are not a witness. We only need you for a victim impact statement, which will only come after a conviction, if any. But we will get a guilty verdict, won't we? I can't say. Witnesses say that he was using his phone. The only phone the police found had not sent messages for several hours. His online records confirm this. If the defense uses this to introduce an element of doubt, he could get away with it. Tears welled up in Maria's eyes. I want to look at him. Where should I go? Like I said, we won't need you until we have a conviction. If you want to watch the proceedings, you will have to sit in the public gallery. He walked her to the entrance to the public gallery and left her. Maria found a seat on the front bench of the gallery. She had a wonderful view of the entire hall. She looked at her watch. It was Tenkirinketam. While she was getting comfortable, two bailiffs led the defendant inside. Suddenly, she didn't feel very well. The defendant brought in was Paul. She ran out to the toilet. By the time she returned to court, Paul was in the dock and the trial was in full swing. The clerk read out the charges. Paul Arthur Robinson, you are charged with dangerous driving and causing the death of William Robert Lancaster. How do you plead guilty or innocent? Guilty, Your Honor. Silence filled the courtroom. The defense lawyer looked surprised. He jumped up and shouted to the judge, I request a ten-minute break, my lord. I don't think my client fully understands the consequences of his statement. Mr. Jeffers, am I to understand that this statement came as a surprise to you? Yes, my lord. It is so. Very good. Ten minutes. Can I talk? asked Paul. The judge nodded to him. I don't need ten minutes, Your Honor. I know the consequences of my statement. But I can get you out. Jeffers hissed at him furiously. No more. You can't. He looked at the judge. I have a chance to tell you what happened, right? Yes, you can make an application for mitigation of punishment. Okay, then let's get on with it. This went on long enough. It took the court ten minutes to calm the courtroom. Paul was led to the witness stand. 
Entering the box, he looked at Maria and mouthed, I'm sorry. She looked at him only with contempt. You bastard, she whispered back to him with only her lips. The judge told him to continue his statement. Your Honor, the witnesses were mistaken. I didn't send a text message just before the accident. Make up your mind, Mr. Robertson. You pleaded guilty, and now you say the witnesses were wrong. I didn't send a text message, Your Honor. I received a video message from my wife. Sometimes when I'm away, my wife sends me messages with photos and videos. You know these things, intimate photos, videos. She does this to show me how much she misses me, Paul continued. This message came from my wife's phone, but it was not from my wife. What I saw was another man bragging about having sex with my wife. It was such a shock that I could not function normally. This sounds more like a defense than a commutation, Mr. Robertson. No, that's not true, Your Honor. I know I should never have picked up that phone. Because I did this, the family lost their father, and the wife lost her husband. This is something I will always regret. So what happened when you saw this message? I really don't know, Your Honor. I don't remember much about the road. I must have been driving automatically. When my truck started to lean a little, it brought me back to reality. I saw that the car in front had stopped, but had not completely left the road. I was about to enter the outside lane, but when I looked in the mirror, I saw a car overtaking me. I slammed on the brakes as hard as I could and just prayed that there was no one in the car. It seems your prayers were not answered. They were not heard, Your Honor. I am truly sorry for the impact I had on this family. Paul finished and Maria took the witness stand. She told the court about life without William. She spoke about the impact on the children of having their father taken away from them. By 1 p.m., the judge was ready to pronounce the sentence. He acknowledged that the impact of the report would have been traumatic and acknowledged the fact that the guilty plea would have saved taxpayers' money. He was handed down a sentence of five years in prison. Paul's head dropped as he was led away. Maria looked at him intently, but he never raised his head. Her feelings were in turmoil. She wanted to kill him for taking William, but at the same time she felt sorry for him. He too had a loss, and that loss led to what happened. On Monday at 9 Albuquerque a.m., Maria's friend Sally welcomed her back to work. Well, do you feel better now? Not really, Sally, no. I believe that no, five years is not that long to take a person's life. That's not what I mean. I thought I would make him understand what he did to me. I wanted him to suffer the same way I did. I expected to hate him. When he explained to the court what happened, I realized that his life had been shattered on the same day that he had shattered mine. Now I don't know what I feel. Well, you have a lot of work to do, so you have something to distract yourself with. By the way, if he pleaded guilty, why were you away from home for so long? I took a week off. Mom and Dad were looking after the children so I decided to join them for a few days. We returned home yesterday. Well, I hope the break did you some good, girl, because you have a lot of work to do. The two women went their separate ways and did not meet again until lunchtime when Sally poked her head through Maria's door. We're going to have lunch today. Do you want to go? No, thanks, Sally. I need to go to the sorting office. The postman tried to deliver a package while I was away. Oh, hopefully something nice? I have no idea. I don't expect anything. Well, see you later. Maria went out to pick up the package and returned to her office, finishing her sandwich when Sally returned. She noticed an unopened package lying on the table. You don't mean to say that you still haven't opened it? Come on, girl, let's see what this surprise is. Maria giggled, then took the package. Using a letter opener, she peeled off the brown paper and cut the tape holding the cardboard box together. Inside, she found a smartphone, a charger, and an envelope. On the outside of the envelope were written the words, I'm sorry I have to do this to you, but a promise is a promise. Maria had a premonition of imminent death, but Sally was looking at the phone. Wow, this is some kind of surprise. My brother has the same one. Do you have any idea how much it costs? Maria trembled when she opened the envelope. Inside was a short note. 
Hello, Maria. You will find everything you need on your phone in the Messages folder. You need to look at the messages from Josie. You can do what you want with it. This includes the phone. I won't need it anymore. Paul. Sally excitedly grabbed her phone, turned it on, and started looking for messages from Josie. Here they are! Maria tried to stop her. Sally, I really don't think I... Her speech was interrupted by the sound of Will's voice. Maria grabbed the phone and sat hypnotized. Hello, puppy. Will's voice came through the phone. Just letting you know that there is a real man in town and your beautiful little wife just can't get enough of him. Oh, don't worry, I'll make sure she throws you a bone every now and then, but when I'm in town, she'll come running to me. You don't believe me, do you? You think this is some kind of cruel joke from someone who stole her phone. Well, can you hear that noise in the background? This is her in the shower, putting herself in order. When I finish speaking, you will be able to see some excerpts from today's meeting. Turn it off, Maria shouted as the image changed to a woman with dark hair and green eyes looking straight into the camera. Sally didn't move. Turn it off. She reached out, grabbed the phone, and threw it across the room. Sally stood watching her for a moment, her friend's eyes blazing with rage. So now you know. I'm really sorry, but I couldn't be the one to tell you. I don't have many friends. I couldn't afford to lose the best one. You knew, but you didn't tell me. Why? We all knew this. You must have noticed how the girls acted around him at Christmas parties. Mary's octopus is what we called him because he seemed to have his hands everywhere. Some thought that you turned a blind eye to it. Others saw that you were besotted by it. If we told you, you would call us liars and say that we are jealous. I knew it would take something like this, from his own lips, to make you believe it. I love you, Maria. You are my oldest and dearest friend. I didn't want to lose you to an asshole who couldn't keep his pants down. No, this cannot be true. This simply cannot be. My will wouldn't do anything like that. He just wouldn't. It must be some kind of trick. It wasn't a trick, Maria. Do you want to watch the video again? No, no, I never want to see this again. Yeah, so you know it's real. I don't know anything else. She sat down and began to sob, and Sally stood up. I'm going to see my boss and ask for family leave for you, and then I'll take you home. Sally left the office. She returned ten minutes later to find Maria sobbing. She hugged her friend. Come on, honey. Let's take you home. Sally walked over and took the phone. He was completely dead. She looked at Maria again. Do you know who I really feel sorry for? The poor guy who received this message. I wonder what happened to him. He received five years. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.